Hi, everybody, and glad to have you here with us today from whatever part of the world you may be joining us from. Uh, we're very excited to be part of the World Global Biodiversity Festival for 2021. And the big question that we have today is, can we save the sea turtles of Ghana? So to do so, we're going to look at the species. We're going to look at some of the threats, some of the challenges and what our conservation strategies are. So a little bit of background to us. I'm John Flynn. I'm on the left there. And on the right is Neil Davis, and we're the founder and co-founder of Wild Seas. So we originally met in Greece in 2008, when Neil was working on a sea turtle project. And it was my first time to encounter turtles. I knew nothing about them. Uh, Neil basically informed me about turtles, about the general state of the oceans. And from there, I just developed a big interest in marine conservation. In 2011, Neil got a call to go down to a hotel in Ghana. Now, this hotel was doing a little bit of work to conserve sea turtles, but it wasn't really sure what to do and the correct methodology, so needed some expert input. Now, to set some more of the background, let's look at where Ghana is in a global position. So we have Africa there, and you can see India over to the east. You have the Gulf of Guinea, and just on the first third of the screen, you'll see Ghana there. So Ghana faces into the Gulf of Guinea, which is basically an offshoot of the Atlantic Ocean. It is sub-Saharan and it's a tropical climate, which means the working conditions can actually be quite hard. So that gives you an idea of where Ghana is in terms of the overall picture of Africa. But then closer up in Ghana, we're going to show you the areas where we work. So you'll be able to see Takaradi, you'll be able to see Aksim, and over as far as Nuzalezu. So we're working primarily in the western coastal region of Ghana. So Takaradi would be a very large trawl port. We have very small amount of work there, but the main focus of our operations is between Aksim and Nuzalezu. Now, Nuzalezu itself is actually famous as one of the only stilt villages in Africa. It's actually built on a lake, completely on stilts, a little bit inland. So the nearest town on the coast is called Nalakazo, and that is where we do most of our beach protection work. So if we were to look a little bit more of our own background and how we've ended up here, we mentioned about the fact that Neil got called to go to this hotel to try and explain how to do conservation work. Now, despite the fact that sea turtles are protected, in Ghana under the wildlife conservation regulations. In reality, there is practically zero enforcement because there is a lack of willingness on the part of a lot of local authorities to get involved against what's seen as against the local community, because these communities, we must remember, have relied on the ocean for generations and generations. So trying to suddenly come in and say, you can't do what you've been doing, isn't going to work. So from the very beginning, we have had to work out a system that will work, that will actually gain the support of the communities. So we realized that as things were, they couldn't stay that way. So we did need to design some form of community-based conservation program. So we decided that without having the commitment of the communities, we weren't going to get anywhere. So the first thing was to identify what sort of turtles there were and what the roles of each turtle is in Ghana. So there are five species of turtle inhabit Ghana and the Ghanaian waters, the largest being the leatherback and the smallest being the hawksbill. Now, each of these turtles has its own ecological role. However, in terms of working with local communities along the coast, that's not a particular area of interest to them because they see turtles as a source of free protein from the oceans. But when we're working with fishermen, it's very important that we instill in fishermen an understanding of why each species of turtle is important and what role it plays in the ocean. So let's just briefly look at some of the ecological roles that sea turtles do play. If we look at green turtles, we'll see that they maintain healthy seagrass beds because their diet is primarily vegetarian and they will actually eat seagrass. So if you have a long stalk of grass and it's going rotten near the top, they'll clip it near the bottom like a lawnmower which means that you end up with a cleaner, healthier seagrass bed. Now, seagrass beds are important because it's an important spawning area for a lot of fish. 
If we were to look at, say, the hawksbill turtle, they actually maintain coral reefs in good condition, and they provide also habitat for small, freshly hatched fish. So we can see there, like, we're balancing marine food webs, and then nesting turtles obviously enrich, enrich the beaches with the nutrients they bring ashore from the oceans. So let's have a brief look at some of the threats that sea turtles are facing. This is not exclusive to Ghana at all. This is pretty much throughout their entire population ranges. So we have ghost nets, which are nets that basically are dumped overboard from fishing boats or get lost at sea unintentionally. We have boat injuries that can actually, like what we see here in this second picture in center top, is a turtle that got hit by a propeller. Then over to the right, we can see where a little hawksbill turtle actually got entangled. And what happened here was some fish wire got caught around its shoulder. And the turtle basically ended up losing the flipper because gangrene had set in. We have ocean pollution, which is very well documented. And what you can see in that green leaf there is actually plastic that came out of a turtle that we rehabilitated. And then you also have loss of nesting habitat, which means that there's less and less places where sea turtles can nest nowadays that they once would have nested. So if we actually look at the video now here, we're going to see a leatherback turtle that was actually caught by a boat, but that was already entangled in a ghost net. And we're going to see that turtle being freed. So Joe is going to play that video for us now. And basically, you don't need to worry about it. The turtle was absolutely fine and the turtle was released. <laughs> Oh yeah, 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 that the video. Oh, I can't do one of those. <laughs> now what you saw there was something that is completely avoidable but it ultimately comes down to people's actions and being conscious and not dumping things into the ocean especially ghost nets next we're going to look at what would be basically some of the ways we can conserve existing populations and try and restore populations back to more historical levels, which were much higher than they are today. So obviously fisheries have a very high level of interaction with sea turtles. So we need to reduce that level of interaction. We need to protect turtles as they come ashore to nest and also protect the hatchlings. Scientists have indicated that roughly one in 1000 hatchlings that emerge is the only one that will make it to an actual reproductive adult. So their overall success rate is extremely low, which means that every single nest is very important. We have the communities that are affected by sea turtles, and these communities, we need to have them on board, as we mentioned earlier on, so that they will actually adopt a willingness to protect turtles and understand that they're an important part of their heritage instead of something that's just to be taken and consumed and be gone forever. Then what has become a very big part of our program that we're going to look at in a few minutes is involving the fishermen, explaining to them the roles of the sea turtles, and basically working with them to save more and more turtles. This idea of working with the fishermen actually came to us when we were walking on the beach one day, because we realized that for every one nest that we were protecting while walking on the beach, which would take like hours every night, we were losing turtles hand over fist through bycatch out in the oceans. So our initial program started with, as we mentioned, protecting the sea turtles on the nesting beaches. So one of the important steps that we had to take there was that we had to provide dedicated hatcheries where we could actually move the sea turtle eggs to, which means that there'd be no fear of them getting tramped or getting poached or getting dug out by like local dogs or anything like that. So one strategy is having the dedicated hatcheries, which protects the hatchlings prior to their departure to the sea. Another step that we have is the anti-poaching patrols themselves. 
and then the relocating of the nests into the hatcheries. So quite often you would find that people will actually walk along these beaches at night time during the sea turtle nesting season. And basically, if they find the sea turtle, they'll just take the turtle and they'll take the eggs and the turtle never gets back to the sea and the eggs get consumed. So it is important to have a very visible presence in these communities so that they know that if we're on the beach, we actually are authorized to do what we are doing. And thereby, if we catch them with the turtle or with eggs, they know that they can find themselves in quite a lot of trouble. So as part of our nest anti-poaching and nest relocation program, we fill in a data sheet for each sea turtle that we come across. And that allows us to keep a record of the species, the location, the date and time of nesting. And it also gives us an approximation then for when the uh, nest will actually hatch and that the hatchlings can be released so they can go to the sea by themselves. Now, one thing that's very important is when hatchlings are being released, if you ever do happen to find yourself on a beach with hatchlings, never take one and just put it straight into the water. They have to crawl down the beach. And the reason for that is twofold. They have a thing called magnetite in their head, which is basically like a turtle GPS. And it aligns the magnetic poles of the earth. And that allows turtles to navigate. So when they emerge from the nest, that takes a little bit of time to activate and to turn on. And the second thing is that they actually need to build muscle strength in their flippers before they actually hit the ocean. So the best way they can do that is by crawling down the sand. So that's just a little aside from what we're doing ourselves. So another area of our program involves tagging and releasing of sea turtles. So nesting turtles and also turtles caught by fishermen, we tag those with Inconel rust-proof tags and each tag has a unique identifier. And then with that, we also will take down information on a data sheet and that gets submitted to the Cooperative Marine Turtle Tagging Program, which is run out of the University of Florida. On the left-hand picture there, you can see Eric and Isaac, and they actually had an olive ridley turtle there that they had got from a fishing boat. So that turtle was tagged and then it was released after its data was taken. And on the right-hand side, we have Enoch, who is the head of the anti-poaching. And he has two small green turtles there, probably around about six, eight years old. And both of those turtles were actually found drifting in a piece of ghost net that you saw back in slide number four, I think it was. So they were released again by Enoch after having been tagged. And two weeks later, one of those turtles actually was found caught in another piece of ghost net. And we knew it was the same turtle because of the tagging data. So tagging is actually quite important because it allows us to build this bit of a scientific background into local movement of sea turtles. So we looked at pollution earlier on and we saw where there was the bit of plastic on the green leaf that had come out of a sea turtle. So that's this particular turtle you're looking at here. And this turtle is called Billy. Now, you can see that when Billy came in, Billy was extremely weak and couldn't keep the head up. So we actually had to put a little bag of water underneath Billy's chin so that the head would actually stay up and Billy wouldn't drown. And then on the right hand side, you can see Enoch and his associate there, George, and they're actually treating the turtle. So in total, it took us six months before we managed to get all of the plastic out of the turtle. But eventually we were able to re-release the turtle and it was healthy back in the ocean and where it was meant to be. So rescue and rehabilitation, while it's not a big part of our program, we're capable of doing it when the need arises. So it's also important when working in the communities that we don't forget about the next generations coming forward. So we actually run school education programs and we will also sometimes run art competitions as well, which will help engage the children better. The reason we think it's important to work with schools is because these children, when they go home, they can question their parents like, why is this happening? So by giving us giving the message in the school, it helps them bring the message home, which we can't necessarily always do because we can't obviously call house to house trying to explain what needs to be done. So then another area that we work with as well is at the state level. So we're working with officials to try and guide policy and basically bring our on the ground experience of what's happening and what we're actually understanding and seeing from communities into the offices of the legislators. So it's very important that we involve all different stakeholders from the fishermen to state officials to local communities, because without involving everybody, the programs just don't run as well. 
So looking briefly again at the sea turtles, we did look earlier on, but at the green turtle and how it worked in seagrass and the hawksbill for the um, coral reefs. So the only other one there that's, and this is actually an important one, which is the first point, is the leatherback turtle because the leatherback turtle is the biggest sea turtle. It is also an endothermic sea turtle, which means that it can swim to the highest and lowest latitudes because it controls its own body temperature. So it's found out through the greatest range of the ocean. Now, because it is the biggest turtle, it is also naturally a target for fishers because they see it as a higher value and that there's going to have more meat, so they're going to do better out of it. So we need to explain to the fishermen that leatherbacks are particularly important because leatherback sea turtles eat jellyfish and jellyfish main prey is actually fish eggs. So if we have an abundance of jellyfish, we're going to have a dearth of fish eggs. Eventually the fish population will collapse and subsequently the jellyfish population will collapse and the leatherback population will collapse. So by the leatherbacks keeping jellyfish in population numbers in check, it basically keeps the marine ecosystem balanced so that all the different species can actually still live in relative harmony with each other. So we're going to look briefly now, you've seen Neil and you've seen myself, as you probably can imagine, and one of the reasons we're online is because of the global pandemic at the moment, so it's very, very difficult to travel. So what we have done is we have actually appointed one local person down in Ghana to be the country head and he's our main point of contact while we're not there ourselves. So this person's name is Eric Keeson, and he was a runner-up in the Boat International Ocean Awards in 2020. And in 2021, he has been named as one of Africa's top 100 young conservationists. So now Joe is going to actually queue up a video for us that's going to show basically a little clip from Eric telling us a little bit about himself and about the work that he does in Ghana. So we hope you enjoy the little clip. It's not long. Please enjoy it. I am Eric. I have been with Wild Seas since 2012, protecting and engaging myself with sea turtles in Ghana. I've been working with uh, fishermen. Beside me, this is their boat that they use for fishing activities. <coughs> we work with them because of sea turtles. They do bycatch. Through that, our sea turtles education, it has helped us to release the turtles back to the ocean. So any uh, boat that come for the uh, uh, fishing activities, when they have any turtles, we return it back to the ocean. While these have been education programs with the fishmongers, students, kids, and uh, fishermen. We did a lot of activities in the western region of Ghana. We have been visiting the different communities, educating them, telling them much important about tortoise, that they need it, that need to be saved. Through education programs, we have achieved over 2,000 sea tortoise in Ghana. Wasis have working a lot since that time up to yet. Eric and his team are doing a lot of activities through us and we have achieved more because of the global digestive festival. This festival is going to help conversation work and see tortoises to improve and give them more improvement for their work. The motivation is going to let everyone work hardly. We are not going to give up until everyone is the global taking uh, the good steps. We are going to work hard to see that life and turtles are totally need to be saved. The global planet need to uh, come up with a good solution. Then the, some of the solutions going to be happening is that the turtles are going to be saved, the plants are going to be saved animals are going to be protected and the the mammals are going to be get their good standard in life thank you so much so there we had a little bit from eric in his own words 
Eric is actually leading up a team of five different towns where the fishermen all participate with us. And what we do is basically when a fisherman gives us a turtle, we give a fisherman a ticket. And then each month we have a little rewards program. So we don't believe in the idea of a direct payment. But we do understand that when the fishermen are giving over something, it's only fair that we offer them the opportunity of receiving something in return. So by doing this way, we actually gain the support of the fishermen. And it allows us to release more and more turtles. You heard Eric saying there, that we've released over 2,000 turtles since this program began. Now, in the nesting area where we work, we would get approximately 20 nests per year. Each nest, we will say, will give you 1,100 turtles, actual hatchlings on average. So that would be 2,000 hatchlings per year we would normally get. But only two of those hatchlings are likely to actually make it to mature turtles. So while the anti-poaching work is very important, where we actually get the best return for the effort is working with the fishermen due to the very high level of interaction they have with sea turtles. What you're seeing on the left-hand picture there would be a very typical meeting whereby we're actually speaking with some local fishermen and explaining to them why we want them to be involved. And then from time to time, what we will do is we will actually offer extra little incentives such as like t-shirts, or as you can see on the right-hand side there, we actually gave them some rain gear for when they're out fishing. Now, here's an example of another village where it's actually a coastal community and the way that they fish is through the beach seining method. So what you have is you have a boat that will actually drag a net out to sea at one end and bring it around in a big C shape. So you have fishermen at both ends of the net and then they'll pull the net ashore onto the beach with whatever they've managed to catch very near the shore. So these fishermen do also catch sea turtles. So we mustn't focus only on canoe fishermen from the boats that you saw in the background with Eric there a minute ago, but we must also work with the coastal beach sailing fish communities. So there's actually a lot of different stakeholders involved, as you mentioned, state level officials, local law enforcement, the local communities themselves, the village chiefs, the chief fishermen, school kids, just a cross section of the entire community. So there is a lot that we want to achieve and we are getting there step by step. The next big thing is the more fishermen that we can involve, the greater the actual return on our effort is going to be. So we're going to have a quick glance now at what all of this work is about. And Joe's going to show you a video of a sea turtle doing what sea turtles are supposed to do. For us, every sea turtle that goes back to the ocean is an achievement. So many of these sea turtles previously would have been killed by fishermen, but through persistence and through education, and just by sticking to what we've been doing, we're managing to turn things around slowly. But it's not just down to us. Everybody can do their own little part to play. So if you like, there's a number of bullet points there that you can glance at, and you'll see just very, very simple things, but everything together all helps to make a change. Now, I'm sure there's probably a couple of questions that would might come this direction. So if there's anything I can answer, please fire ahead. All right, John, that's great. I'm going to bring uh, myself back in here to, to fire away with a few of those questions. But first, I want to congratulate you on the great work that you're doing. It's, it's always great to hear the stories of where a project comes from, uh, to see how it grows, to see, you know, there's bumps in, in the road and things have to be changed. And, and adapted, but you know the, the community-based method of, of bringing the local population in, 
through education, providing opportunities, incentives, and and jobs, it really does work because you know at the end of the day, nobody wants to uh, you know just destroy their environment to uh, to harm the local ecosystems. You know, people take a, a lot of pride uh, in their in their home environment. So, you know, what you're doing providing these opportunities is is great, and I mean, the evidence is there. You can see how the program is working. It does seem to have kind of grown quite well. I think. At the beginning, when we went in, it's like a lot of people, you think you know pretty much everything, but you very quickly realize you know practically nothing. So for us, the biggest learning curve was actually getting an understanding of these communities, of how they work, of their own needs, and what was creating the problems that we were trying to solve. So once we gained that understanding, it let us get a lot more traction. And one of the ways that we did go about gaining that understanding was actually saying to the local people quite up straight up front that look, we don't know how this works. How does this work in your communities? And I think that actually got us quite a lot of respect because instead of having an overly confident, bordering on arrogant attitude that like, this is what you're going to do. It was kind of like, this is what we want you to do. Can you tell us how we might be able to get this to happen? Yeah, absolutely. It kind of builds that ownership, that sense of pride uh you know when they see the program grow as well um you know meeting eric was really great you know it's exciting to see young leaders um you know future conservationists and so is that kind of the 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 big goal is you've got it going it's local leaders on the ground picking it up and then you can kind of step back a little bit and let it be run more locally that's actually exactly the idea behind it i think if we build a program like this that's permanently, we'll say, run from the outside for want of a better way of putting it, then people will revert to form if that outside support is just suddenly taken away. Whereby if you build a program around the local community in the first instance, that program has a lot better chance of long-term sustainability. Absolutely. And then do you think this is a program that, you know, it worked well in one area? Is it something you're going to try to to implement in other spots maybe africa other countries other organizations yes well what we did was we actually introduced a similar program in the gambia just before we went into the whole lockdown last year so unfortunately that program didn't get traction because we weren't able to support it for long enough because of the lockdowns but we've also been speaking with people in senegal and this is in particular relation to working with the fishermen we've explained the program to them we've given them all the templates and it's a program that we would hope to actually introduce there as well. So it's been designed and it has taken 10 years to get to that point, but it's been designed in such a way that it's replicable worldwide. All right. Well, John, what a great program. Um, as a diver myself, there's nothing better than being in the water uh, and, and seeing a sea turtle doing its thing. Um, it's pretty amazing. And uh, it, it's great to see the buy-in from the community and not only the protection on the beach, but, you know, the protection on the, the side of the fishermen uh, to the point where they're actually bringing the turtles so you can help them and get them back uh, into the water. Because you're right, those mature ones are so important with so, so few making it there that uh, maximizing that conservation is, is so important. So thank you so much, John, for the project and sharing it with us today. You're very welcome. As I say, it's been a pleasure to be part of the Global Biodiversity Festival. And I'm just going to leave you with the final closing slide now. So if you want to actually go and check out our work, um, our website is from prehistoric times, but our Facebook page is reasonably up to date. So you'll be able to find the details there now. And we'd also like to give a quick shout out to the um, Marine Conservation Action Fund of the New England Aquarium for their support through the years as well. So we hope you've enjoyed the presentation and um, basically keep the faith, everybody, and we're going to make the planet a better place. Thank you very much. <laughs>